All right, here's a question we ask ourselves all too often. How often are you checking trail cameras in the summer? A lot of different opinions. We asked Tony Peterson, Byron Horton, and Harry Peer on their strategy for summertime scouting with trail cameras. Hope you guys enjoy the conversation. If you do, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. Now let's get right into it. How often are you checking your trail cameras throughout the summer? Every couple of weeks, maybe. Okay. So I, this, this is another thing that I've tried to be way more patient with is just give them the time to tell me something, you know, you, you know how it is. Like you first get trail cameras, you want to check them constantly. And I, I tend to use most of my trail cameras in other States anyway, like over in Wisconsin on some of the private land I have over there. So it's not like I can just go run out quick and check them anyway. But even, even when I can, I'm like, I want to, I want enough information where it's going to work for me. If it's, if it's going to do what I need it to do. And I don't run cameras. Like, uh, I try to really force myself to run cameras in places I'm curious about. Like I try to use them for scouting, you know, like I know a lot of people want to get inventory or whatever, which is fine. But for me, I'm always like cameras are in question mark spots. Like I'm, I'm I just wonder who's going through here. And it doesn't do me any good to go in right away to check them. You know what I mean? Like I need a little bit of a picture, at least a couple of weeks or a month or something. So I, I like to try to let them soak for a while. In the summer, I am a more put them out, let them soak. And then I do a pool, let's call it in an ideal world, September, mid to early September. And that is, that is a time thing. I, I, the areas that I'm hunting, a lot of times a camera pool is is several hours. Uh, by the time I drive, let's say you walk a half a mile, uh, check the car, do whatever you got to do and get out. I mean, that's one camera and, and that literally took you three to four hours. Now, I like to stack my cameras close together where I can pop into the woods for, let's say, an hour loop and check three cameras. And so I'm a big proponent of um, I even did it when my son was born. I put cameras out at the end of turkey season in May and adjusted the delay for a longer period of time, knowing I, I really and I really only care about that data uh, August ish into the September months. I don't really care about June, July stuff so much where I'm hunting. So, yeah, I do the one pool in uh, September ish and I may not get to all of them. I may have cameras that I haven't touched and they're just operating and I'll start um, hopefully scouting and checking those come season. Do you ever think it would be beneficial to maybe have a uh, a, a, a pool, a card pool somewhere, maybe in the July month. Um, and I asked that question based on another question. Have you ever had, you know, that September card pool, uh, at the end of the season and then find that a specific camera weeds have blown up or that you've had a dead fall down and you have two months of just nonstop false triggers because, uh, something changed in that environment on that set. Absolutely. Like that would be the benefit to checking a camera, say in August, July is, Oh, did, uh, did I have some sort of failure where maybe my mount uh, has slipped? Uh, we get a lot of raccoons that tip our cameras over and I've had trees literally solid tree. The only tree that fell on this hillside is the one that my camera was tied to. It's like, how does this happen? <laughs> um, the, the false trigger or maybe a, a, a battery issue. Yeah. A technical failure would be the only major, major benefit for me checking cams, but that's also a whole day gone. And, in the, uh, the working man, the family man, it's like, I, I would rather save the time to be gone in September and maybe find that camera had failed versus go in August and, and find that camera failed. Uh, and I would say the, another thing that I do is I volume shoot areas. I'm finding benefits to running cameras as close to 50, 75 yards apart uh, because I have so many failures on elevated sets. It's just a higher failure rate. Angles are wrong. False triggers didn't hit the trail you were looking for. Fall, uh, elevated sets really magnify camera error. So I'm a volume shooter. If you had to draw a line in the sand and pick a date that all your cameras had to be out, Again, this is around summer trail cameras. What is that date? Like, when do all your cameras need to be in the woods working for you? I uh, I don't want all my cameras in the woods at one given time, just because I may stumble across something in season scouting and want two or three to deploy. Um, so I do try and hoard twenty uh, percent as a rough estimate, maybe ten twenty percent that I can deploy at a given time. And if they're all operating by season start, that would be great. September one would be ideal, but yeah, so either of those two dates is, is probably good. The answer is it depends. And I'll explain that if I'm using trail cameras in Kentucky, which is a bait state, I'm trying to give at that point in time, there's not a lot we can do with antler development. I'm putting them out July 4th time frame in there. I really don't care before that because 
the antler is not big enough that I can even see. I'm just burning battery, data plans, you know, putting more intrusion going in. Usually July 4th, you can at least see the frame structure of the antlers and know what you're getting. Uh, so in Kentucky, it's a little bit different because I have to go in there and fill that feeder. I have to go in there and replenish that mineral. Um, so I'm putting obviously cameras on there to get my inventory. Um, I think for everybody, Velvet Fest is, I think a term you guys, you know, first, first used. That's fantastic. That's the anticipation of what we have for hunting season right that's that's Absolutely. getting us geared up you know i got a shooter or this buck returned that i found the sheds on or he's here um this time of the year is simply about inventory what made it through that we don't know about what is here but in kentucky i'm on feed and mineral i mean that's the easiest place to get them even if it's nighttime that's okay i think when you're when you're focusing on summer bachelor groups even if it's nighttime pictures all you need to know know is whether he's there or not i think your hunting strategy can be completely different once hunting season comes and that velvet sheds and bachelor groups is off kentucky offers a little bit different of a scenario there in that we open up hunting season the first week of September. So uh, in Kentucky, it's a little bit more vital for me to understand that bachelor group because I have a chance to hunt that bachelor group. Whereas you guys in Ohio, Illinois, um, you're not opening up until that, that velvet's gone for the most part. The bachelor group has dispersed out into their fall range and starting that October strategy. I do like putting cameras on transitions of corn and alfalfa. I work really hard on my properties to create height variations in my crop rotation. So like I'll have beans to clover or I'll have corn to beans or corn to alfalfa to where there's literally a wall or height variation. It doesn't, it, it can even be beans to clover, you know, it doesn't have to be up high, but the, the deer funnel that edge. In Illinois, uh, where we hunt, there's no supplemental feeding, no mineral. So we're identifying um, if we're in big ag country, most of the times uh, the maternal aggression of the does will keep the best habitat for the does and the fawns. The bucks go out into open ag country. You know, that's why you see all these guys driving around Illinois, open ag country with binoculars and spotting scopes on their windows because they're looking out over these four or 500 acre bean fields and seeing the, you know, top foot of the, the deer's neck you know, sticking up over it, you know, you're looking for those bachelor groups. You're looking to identify a, a giant basically is, is, you know, do I have a booner sitting out there? And once I know where that bachelor group is from there, you kind of spread your trail cameras out in different directions. If you can get access to figure out where is he going to do a fall range at, but at least, you know, one's there. Otherwise you're throwing blind darts, but in both cases, putting them out in uh, around July 4th, to get inventory as far as how often I'm checking them. Kentucky, I'm checking them a little bit more because I'm in there anyway with food replenishment. Um, try to do, when I check the trail camera, it's consistent as far as time method. Um, and every time I'm leaving that spot, I'm leaving something positive for the deer because they'll pattern you before you pattern them. Uh, Lee Lakoski's talked about that so many times is every time they go in, they're leaving something positive for the deer. So they're associating your smell, your presence, your pressure uh, with food, mineral, something there in a supplemental feeding. So try to be consistent there, but I am checking it more in Kentucky because I'm in there anyway. Um, I'm trying to get that pattern a little bit tighter uh, because I can hunt them, you know, with that bachelor group pattern in Kentucky. Most of, you've been to my house, most of those five and a half year old bucks on my wall were shot early season in Kentucky. But then in Illinois, man, we, we set the cameras up and let them, let them soak all summer. It does us no good. You know, we can't hunt them till October. Um, it does us no good to be in there, boogering them up. And we'll, we'll usually pull the first, I don't know, I think usually mid August to Memorial Day, right before I start Kentucky season, I'll go back to Illinois, pull all those cameras, do inventory, and then relocate relocate those cameras to fall spots off of the um, off of the bachelor group spots because it's out in open ag. Completely apples and oranges, different approach that people got to adjust and adapt based on what their property is.